Hello and welcome to English Worship. I hope everyone's been enjoying the week and enjoying the warm weather outside. Let us now come and worship our Lord um, with song and praise.
So sweet, just in Jesus, just to take him at his word, and just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him and oh Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him Lord. His cleansing blood And just in simple faith To plunge me Beneath the healing Cleansing blood And Jesus, Jesus How I trust Him How I proved Him over and over And Jesus, Jesus
Let us come together in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sustaining us through another week. Thank you for your provisions, your peace and grace for our families and our church. We come before you with thanksgiving and praise for you alone deserve all glory and honor. Lord, we know that we are undeserving of your love, but you call us to be your children and instruments of light and blessing to others. Forgive us when we fail or falter in our obedience and when we seek our own desires and goals. Please take a moment now to say your own confessions. Gracious Father, thank you for your forgiveness of our sins. Help us to live by the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill your purposes. Almighty God, We continue to lift up our families, 
communities, and even our world to you as we daily face the realities of the coronavirus. We pray for all world leaders as they struggle to contain this pandemic and to keep their citizens safe. Please give them wisdom for the many difficult decisions they make, a clear vision to lead courageously and competently, and a broad and deep understanding of the true problems they face. May they also govern with caring and compassionate hearts. May they come to you for help in humility and reverence. Sovereign Lord, you know that the pandemic is not the only critical issue in the world. We pray for the end of wars and brutal hostilities, for the containment of other communicable diseases, for the accessibility of nutritious food, clean water, sanitary conditions, and education to many living in poverty and underdeveloped countries. Lord God, help not only the leaders of these places, but move us to care for our fellow man. Help us to be the image of Christ in all that we do or think and become part of the solution that this world needs. Use us as lights in this dark world. May your compassion and grace be extended through your people to heal this world. Lord God, now may your grace also extend to Pastor Chris as he preaches the word to us this morning. Help us to not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of your word. Lord God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Over the years, when I've led youth small groups on Friday nights, you know, towards the end of the Bible study time, we normally end with prayer. And sometimes I ask the question, what's one praise that you have from this past week? Or what's one prayer request? And oftentimes, you know, the students answer, uh, you know, I can't think of any praises. There's nothing, there's nothing to praise God for. And uh, maybe they just don't want to share their praise with me. Maybe they, um, you know, are too lazy to actually think through what they, they can praise God for. Um, but I think this, you know, idea that maybe there's nothing to praise God about um, seeps into our lives sometimes too. Even I sometimes am maybe a little bit uh, discouraged by things going on in life, right? Um, especially these days, there's a, a deadly pandemic that has affected all of our lives in one way or another. Um, we've been sheltered in place for many months. Um, you know, our, our country is very divided over a lot of different issues, uh, whether it's politics or, or wearing masks and all these different things. Uh, there's injustices in our country and in the world. So it might be easy for us to say, you know, there's really nothing that I can praise God for. Um, but this morning, we'll be looking at God's word and seeing that indeed there are many reasons we can praise God, uh, many reasons why we can rejoice. So um, two weeks ago, we started a new series on the Psalms. And one of the reasons why we want to look at Psalms is because uh, I believe it helps us to connect with God. Uh, in the Psalms, the psalmists often face many different circumstances. Uh, they might be rejoicing, they might be praising God, and other times they're facing difficult circumstances. So there's laments and uh, different types of psalms. And two weeks ago, um, Pastor Ron talked about how we can draw near to God through praise. And last week, Pastor Bruce reminded us that we can trust God um, even as we face our fears. So this morning, we'll be continuing in looking at another psalm of praise, Psalm 145, and we'll be looking at different reasons we can praise God. So please uh, turn to Psalm 145 in your Bibles if you have them. And before I read, uh, I want to give us a little bit of context about this psalm. Uh, the psalm was written by David, and it, it was probably um, written towards the latter end of his life. It was actually the very last psalm that was attributed to David. So as you can imagine, David has gone through many different things in life. Um, just you know, looking at some of the highlights and lowlights, he he fought and killed Goliath, which was a highlight. Um, but then later on, he uh, was chased by Saul, right? Saul, King Saul wanted to kill him. So that was probably a low light. Um, and then God delivered him from Saul. You know, he had opportunities to kill Saul, which I guess was a highlight. Uh, later on, he fell to sin with Bath Bathsheba and uh, ended up having her husband murdered, which was probably a low light. So we can see that, you know, David went through the whole gamut of different experiences, probably different emotions. 
And this psalm is kind of at the end of his life, um, maybe summarizing like all of his experiences through everything that he's gone through. He writes this psalm of praise. Uh, I also want to mention a few other interesting notes about the psalm. Out of 150 psalms, right, in our Bible today, this is the only psalm that's titled a psalm of praise. Out of all 150, this is the only one that officially has the title, a psalm of praise. Um, In Jewish practice, the psalm was actually recited three times a day, uh, at least twice in the morning and once in the evening. So it's a very important psalm in Jewish tradition because it points people towards praising God. Um, It's also an acrostic psalm, which means that each verse of the psalm begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And however, in this particular psalm, um, in the original Hebrew text, it's actually missing one of the letters. Um, So if you notice in your Bibles, depending on your translation, uh, between verses 13 and 14, at least in the ESV, which we'll be reading, there's two extra lines. And those were added in uh, later on to, I guess, uh, fill in the gaps. And there's different reasonings behind, you know, maybe why that letter was missing or why they replaced it. And we won't be getting into that this morning, but I just thought it's kind of an interesting note in case you're wondering why some translations have those two extra lines and some do not. Um, so let's go ahead and read Psalm 145. The title is Great is the Lord, a song of praise of David. Psalm 145, verse 1. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So this morning, I want to unpack some of the things that David praises God for. And I want us to also learn to praise God for those very same things, because, you know, God is the same um, back in David's day as he is today. And I'm not sure how many of you normally take notes, um, but I encourage you, especially today, to, as we're going through these different reasons we can praise God, I encourage you just to jot them down Um, and then maybe even add some of your own praises because hopefully this can be like a praise journal or something that you can look back on and see like as a reminder, these are the things I can praise God for. Or maybe you can even pray through them. um, And whenever you pray, just take one a day or one a week and say, hey, today I'm gonna focus on uh, this aspect of how or why I can praise God. Um, So I'll be sharing five general uh, groupings or ideas of things we can praise God for. And there's definitely more than just these five things, um, but because the psalm is you know, so long, uh, it's 21 verses, and because we don't have time to tackle each individual verse or individual phrase, I'll just be grouping them into five groupings. Uh, but I definitely encourage you to study this psalm on your own or maybe attend a Sunday, sc- Sunday school class later just to you know, kind of further explore these, these reasons we can praise God. And I also want to mention that there is a lot of overlap between the verses, so um, or even between the points. So, just because I, I break uh, things up by certain verses doesn't mean that 
that are exclusively about you know God's greatness or God's mercy because there is a lot of overlap in in this psalm. Uh, so with that, the very first thing um, we can praise God for, as seen in this psalm, is His greatness displayed through works and deeds. Again, it's His greatness displayed through works and deeds, and we see this in verses three to seven. In verse three, David exclaims. God's greatness. He says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. So David's saying God is so great, right? And that kind of begs the question, well, why is he great? Um, when you look at someone in history, someone, you know, people consider great, and I'm just going to pick Alexander the Great because uh, he has great as part of his name. We say like, well, why is Alexander the Great great? Um, and you know, if you know a little bit about history, he was a king of a huge uh, Macedonian empire. And uh, at least according to history, he never lost a battle or a war. So he was great in his conquests. Um, he conquered much of Asia and Northern uh, Africa. And, you know, he, he was leader of one of the greatest empires in the world. So that's why he's considered great. He has all these accolades or accomplishments to back it up. Um, in sports, in many sports at least, there's arguments and debates about who is the greatest of all time, right? Is it LeBron James? Is it uh, Michael Jordan? And you might compare, you know, statistics, you might compare championships, you might compare impact on the game, and you, because of these things, you know, this person is great. So what makes God great? Uh, David goes on to talk about God's mighty acts, his glorious splendor, his wondrous works, and his mighty deeds. And we don't know exactly what David was referring to, but I just want to give you a few ideas of what I think uh, he was referring to. Uh, first, when we hear the words glorious splendor of your majesty and wondrous works, I think of God's creation. Um, for those of you who know me, I love to be out in nature, um, you know, backpacking, camping. Uh, I love going to Yosemite, Tahoe area, the Sierras, um, you know, even places like Hawaii, they're, they're beautiful. Uh, you go out there and for me, I, I really can see God's um, majesty in his creation. In Psalm 19, verse 1, David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. So, you know, even David agrees, like, all of creation um, works, shows God's majesty and his glorious uh, splendor. But it's not just places uh, and things that God has created, um, but also beautiful people, right? Every one of us, I guess. Um, in Psalm 139, which we'll be covering in a few weeks, David writes, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So even God's creation of man is wonderful, right? Even when God created Adam and Eve, right? He said they were very good. So God's creation points to his greatness. Um, and then, you know, in these verses also mentions the phrases mighty acts and mighty deeds. I think of the things that God has done in, in David's life and also in Israel's history. Um, even though David lived uh, several hundred years after kind of the, um, you know, Abraham, Isaac, the fathers of the faith, uh, David knew about all the things that God had done done for Israel. He knew about, you know, uh, God's covenant with Abraham to give the people of Israel a promised land. Um, David knew about how God brought the, the Israelites out of Egypt, um, how he provided Moses with the 10 plagues, how he led them uh, through the Nile, sorry, not the Nile, the, the Red Sea. Um, and, you know, all along the way, right, God provided for the Israelites. So God, um, you know, he did all these things, maybe not just to show his greatness, but they did show that he is a God who uh, performs these miracles, these mighty deeds, these miraculous acts. And then David knows also for himself um, what God has done for him personally, right? As mentioned earlier, God was with him uh, when he defeated Goliath. Uh, God was with him when Saul was pursuing him. Uh, God was with him as he was king, and he triumphed in many battles. So there are mighty acts and deeds, both in Israel's history, uh, in mankind's history, but also in 
David's own life um, that, I guess, allow him to praise God for, for his greatness. I uh, also just want to point out in verse 4, um, David says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And this is why fellowship is important. Um, we can hear about God's works from one another. We can encourage each other through our sharing and through, through our words. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why when people get baptized, we have them share their testimonies is because we want to hear, you know, how God changed them, how God uh, worked in their lives, not just, you know, to test them or quiz them, but we want to hear people's testimonies so we can all be encouraged. You know, our our church uh, has talked a lot about uh, intergenerational, right, as part of our our vision, and um, you, you hear this word thrown around a lot, but this, this verse also points to, you know, one generation shall commend your works to another. Um, and oftentimes, the, the older generation maybe has a lot more life experience, uh, maybe more wisdom in some ways, more um, things that they've gone through. So they're able to share how God has been faithful to them. They're able to share how God has been great in their lives. And this is not to say that the younger generations cannot also share about God's faithfulness, uh, his greatness to the older um, sometimes when I hear the youth's testimonies or when they're sharing uh, on a Friday night or a Sunday, I'm encouraged because I hear how God is great um, in their lives as well. So I just want to kind of pause here and ask uh, all of us, you know, in what ways has God been great in, in your lives, in our lives? Uh, what are some reasons why we can praise God for what he has done? Um, so some of these might be like David. Uh, there are things that are uh, things in the history, uh, in the past, but we can also look at how God has worked in our own lives or in the lives of others around us. So I encourage you to maybe jot these down, um, or if you have some time later, come back to this and write down what are some ways that we see God's greatness through his, um, through his works and through his mighty deeds. The next thing we can praise God for is his grace and his mercy. His grace and mercy. And we see this in verses 8 and 9. Um, to, to see an example of God's mercy in action, we're going to take a look at Exodus. And when David says in verse 8, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, he's actually quoting from Exodus. Um, in Exodus 20, just to back up a little bit, God gives Israel the Ten Commandments. Um, right? Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and receives the tablets. And one of the Ten Commandments is that they aren't to have any idols or carved images. And later on, God actually specifies um, that they're not to have any idols, uh, any gods of gold, right? And then later on, Moses returns up to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. And in Exodus 32, because Moses was taking such a long time, the people, um, I guess, rebelled against God and they, they wanted something to worship. They wanted gods to worship, so they built the golden calf, which is something uh, very specifically God told them not to do, right? So this is like if a parent tells a child, um, you can't go out tonight. You absolutely have to stay home. And then three minutes later, the child sneaks out the door and uh, goes out or something like that. Uh, That's a direct, I guess, violation of, of the order or of the rule. And I would say, you know, is deserving of some kind of punishment because they didn't obey. So in this case, um, that's what the Israelites did. They directly violated the Ten Commandments, which had just been given not that long ago uh, by building this golden calf. And in this case, the punishment for Israel for breaking the covenant was death, right? But God relented out of his compassion and out of his mercy. Um, In chapter 34, after God had asked Moses to um, remake the stone tablets, the previous ones were broken. Uh, Moses broke them out of anger. Uh, It says, the Lord came down in the cloud and passed before Moses. And then in Exodus 34, verse six, it says, this is God talking about himself. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So that is, you know, the, the quote, Um, the verse that David is quoting in the psalm. And I believe the reason why David quotes this verse 
And the reason why you know, I'm explaining uh, the background of the verse is to illustrate how God is merciful towards us. Um, we, like David, right, who you know, committed all these sins, like the Israelites, we have sinned against God in many different ways. Maybe we, we haven't committed the same sins as David or as Israel, um, but we have all rebelled against God in one way or another, and for most of us, in many different ways. Um, so if God was not merciful, if he was not slow to anger, abounding in love, uh, we would have been condemned, destroyed for our transgressions a long time ago, right? because we know the wages of sin is death. But out of God's mercy and out of his grace, uh, that he sent his son Jesus um, to the cross to die for our sins. And it was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us and was risen so that we can have life in him. And that's the ultimate um, show of his mercy and of his, of his grace. It's not anything we, we earned or deserved, uh, but it was done out of his love for us. Uh, in 1 Peter 1.3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right, so praise be to God for his grace and his mercy. Third, we can praise God for his eternal kingdom. His eternal kingdom. Um, one aspect of the kingdom of God is how great it, how great it is, which uh, we already talked about. Verses 10 through 12 talk about God's works, uh, his mighty acts, bless him and extol him. Uh, his creation speaks of the glory and tells us of the power of his kingdom. Um, so we've kind of already covered, you know, the greatness of God. But in verse 13, it adds another element that we can praise God for. It says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. We read that again. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Uh, when I think of the word kingdom, I, I think of the, the kingdom of Cambodia, uh, because Gloria and I, um, years ago, we, we spent a couple months uh, living there. And even though today Cambodia is considered a developing country, uh, back a long time ago, uh, the Khmer Empire, uh, which is the predecessor to Cambodia, was one of the greatest civilizations on the earth. Um, Today, you know, when you go to Cambodia, a lot of the tourist attractions are the temples or the things that are, were built um, back in those days, like a thousand years ago or more than a thousand years ago. So when we were there, we, we took several tours. Um, we learned all about their history, all these different kings and all these different uh, temples and buildings. And you, you go to Angkor Wat, which is like a huge uh, complex even. It's not just one building, but it's a complex. Um, and Historians, experts say that during its peak uh, in the 11th to 13th centuries, so about, you know, a thousand years ago or 800 to a thousand years ago, uh, Angkor was the largest urban center in the world. So all that to just kind of say, like, this was one of the greatest empires. And uh, here we are several hundred years later or a thousand years later. And all it is is basically a bunch of ruins. And... Um, you know, Cambodia, the country today, is still kind of a developing country. But all this to say that no matter how great a kingdom or how great an empire is, or even how great a leader is, um, they will all eventually fall. The Khmer Empire fell, um, Alexander the Great fell, and, you know, countries rise and fall. Um, but God's kingdom, in contrast, is an everlasting kingdom. This, mean that, this means that his reign will never end. His dominion endures forever. There will be no point in time that some other kingdom will maybe conquer or take over for the kingdom of God. Uh, there's many different aspects to God's kingdom, and there's many different views on the end times. But the bottom line for those of us who place our trust in Jesus Christ uh, is that we will spend eternity in heaven with God. So that's a huge encouragement to us because no matter the difficulties that we're facing, um, no matter you know, our life situation, our future is secure. No matter you know, what pain or suffering we're going through right now, we have hope for the future. In 2 Corinthians um, chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, Paul writes to the Corinthian church, 
So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us, preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So what this verse is, this passage is saying is basically, even though uh, we might be you know, suffering or going through difficulty in this life, these things are all temporary compared to the eternal kingdom uh, of God. So the encouragement for us um, is that we can praise God, not only because his uh, kingdom is eternal, but because we get to participate in that kingdom as his beloved children and as co-heirs with Christ. Fourth, we can praise God because of his faithfulness and his providence. His faithfulness and providence. This is from verses 14 to 16. Uh, these days, you know, there's many people in need around us, and I'm sure even in our congregation as well. Uh, you may be facing difficulties of various kinds, uh, whether it be physical sickness, economic hardship, uh, emotional turmoil, relationship difficulties, um, spiritual valleys, or otherwise. But we know that God is faithful. We know that he will never fail you. Um, he will never forsake you. He will guard you against the evil one. He will hear our prayers and will supply every need according to his riches. All throughout the Bible, God seems to emphasize his care for those who fall and those who are humbled. In Old Testament, in Psalm 34, it says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And then in the New Testament, in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit and blessed are those who mourn. There's many other verses like these. Um, and for me personally, the times I've experienced God's comfort and peace the most were um, when in the times that I was struggling the most, right? And maybe it's because when we're most down, when we're bowed down, when we're humbled, that's when we turn to God. But, you know, through, through my experiences, um, I found that God is always faithful. He, you know, never breaks any of his promises. When, when I turn to him for peace, he provides peace. Uh, when I need to be comforted, he comforts. Um, so when David says that the Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down, we should take comfort in knowing that he cares for us. Uh, we can trust him, that we can trust that when we turn to him in need, uh, he won't just ignore us or, you know, be silent necessarily, but um, he's there for us. He might not necessarily respond in the way or in the timing that we want or expect, but God is always faithful to his promises. Similarly, in verses 15 to 16, uh, David praises God as a provider. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail uh, here. I actually spoke on this a, a few months ago from Matthew 6 about not worrying because God who loves you and is all powerful uh, a God who takes care of the birds and the flowers and the grasses, you know, he will take care of you. So whatever circumstances you're facing right now, uh, we can praise God for his faithfulness and his providence. Lastly, we can praise God for his righteousness and his justice. His righteousness and justice. Um, admittedly, this is pretty hard for me. Um, it's not something I do very regularly. Um, I don't really think about God's justice or righteousness, let alone praise him for it. Um, but imagine if there were a perfect judge, a judge who is perfect in his rulings and his decisions, uh, no matter how difficult the case, no matter how much evidence there is or how many witnesses there are or whatever it is, um, no matter what, this judge judges fairly. Uh, that's who God is, right? That's what it means that he is righteous and just. Um, according to his righteousness and justice, he also judges humanity justly and rightly. And the bad news for us is that we cannot obtain righteousness on our own. Um, if we were to be judged rightly based on our works, we know that none of us is perfect, right? Not even one. So we are all guilty and worthy of condemnation. And this is what we see in the second half of verse 20, is uh, God will destroy the wicked, um, which to us might seem unfair or might seem really harsh, but in reality, because of God's holiness, um, 
because of his justice, because of his righteousness, it is the right thing for him to do is to destroy the wicked. But as we mentioned before, because of God's grace and mercy, through Jesus' sacrifice, uh, which we talked about earlier, we have Christ's righteousness um, imputed to us, which means that uh, when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ and not our unrighteousness. Uh, We actually studied Romans 3 in Abound this week, and that chapter of Romans is basically exactly what um, this, you know, righteousness is about. It talks about God's righteousness, it talks about man's unrighteousness, and talks about how um, we, the unrighteous, receive righteousness through Christ. So if you want to kind of understand this concept better, I encourage you to take a look at Romans 3. Um, But it's this righteousness um, that that we have through Christ that allows, you know, in in the earlier verses 17 and 19, it says, um, he is near to all those who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him, right? He watches over those who love him. And we might think, well, is that right? Because we're sinners. But in reality, um, God sees us as righteous. So even as he's loving us, even as he's fulfilling our desires, that is righteous and that is just for him to do because of the righteousness that we have in Christ. Um, So again, he is the perfect judge. Uh, He judges rightly whether you face life or death. But the the great thing about this judge is that he is not only the judge, but he is the judge who offers you a lifeline. He's the judge who gives you a way out of your your death uh, sentence. So we can praise God um, because of his righteousness and because of his justice. So to quickly summarize um, a few reasons we we went over this morning, we can praise God because of his greatness displayed through his works and deeds. Uh, We can praise him because of his grace and mercy. We can praise him because of his eternal kingdom. We can praise him because of his faithfulness and providence. And lastly, we can praise him for his righteousness and justice. You might have noticed that I've skipped uh, verses 1 and 2 at the beginning of the psalm and also verse 21 at the end. That's because I wanted to kind of go through all these reasons for why we can praise him and then kind of circle back to David's introduction and his conclusion. Um, and let me read those, those three verses for us first. Uh, verses 1 and 2 say, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And verse 21 My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord uh, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So it's clear to me that like David's thrust, like his main point, his his thesis, his conclusion is all about praising God. And uh, I kind of call this an attitude of praise or a lifestyle of praise. Through everything David's gone through, he still ends up at a place of praise. Um, he recognizes who God is and he worships him. He extols him. Um, and he doesn't just praise him once in a while when he remembers to. Uh, he doesn't just praise God on the weekends or at church, um, but he blesses him every day forever and ever. So it's, it's a whole attitude or a lifestyle of praise. So my encouragement for us this morning um, is to try to be like David in making a habit of praising God. Uh, You know, whenever you pray, praise him for who he is. Praise him for his greatness. Praise him for his grace and mercy. Praise him for his justice and righteousness. Um, We need to recognize all the reasons we can praise God and, like David, develop this attitude of praise. Um, I know it's a lot to remember, maybe all the different things we talked about today, but hopefully if you wrote some of these things down, you can go back to them. Um, And I mentioned before, maybe this week, pick one aspect of you know, one reason we praise God and focus on that, on that reason. And then in the next week, you can pick something else and praise God for something different. But I, I really believe that um, if we develop this attitude of praise and worshiping God, um, I think it'll help us in definitely in our relationship with him, but just in our daily lives and our daily walks, because um, a lot of us, myself included, uh, sometimes, you know, I get in a negative mindset or I'm complaining or I get really down. And I think, Uh, worship of God, praising God kind of cures all those things, right? It cures um, anxiety and worry and 
just kind of being down because it takes the focus off of us. When we're looking at our own situations and we get down on ourselves, it's because we're so focused on us. But if we focus on God, on who he is, on his, you know, all the things we talked about, grace, mercy, uh, his greatness, his kingdom, the future we have, um, it shifts our perspective from ourselves and kind of the temporal and then it pushes the focus to God and on the eternal. Um, so, you know, that's the encouragement for all of us is to be able to focus on praising God in this week and as we continue to live our lives. Um, so this morning, we're going to do something a little bit different. I know that we normally don't use the YouTube chat other than to say good morning to everyone. Um, but this morning, uh, Stephen's going to lead us in a response song. And as we, as we sing and as we worship, um, I'm going to ask all of us to type in the chat um, just different reasons why you praise God. And it can be things uh, that we talked about this morning from the psalm, but it can also just be praises from your own life. And like we mentioned earlier uh, in verse four, it talks about how you know, we should, in a way, encourage one another um, to praise, right? To share about God's greatness and his mighty works. So um, we're gonna transition into a time of worship and please just, uh, you know, while you're worshiping, also please take the time to um, encourage others uh, in, in praising God communally, uh, corporately.